Now on BBC News, Hard Talk. Welcome to Hard Talk with me, Zainab Badawi, from the London Coliseum, where my guest is French-born ballerina Sylvie Guillem. For more than three decades, she has dominated the world of ballet and has pushed the boundaries of the genre. At the end of this year, she retires. She is undoubtedly one of the greatest dancers of her generation, but she'll also be remembered as Mademoiselle Non for being too assertive in her career. We talked to her about that, as well as her environmental activism to save the planet. Sylvie Guillem, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you very much, Zanab. You are arguably the greatest ballerina of your generation, and yet the irony is you never set out to be a ballet dancer. What is the sort of lesson in that? Well, I think it was very lucky for me to, be, to come from nowhere because I had no uh, expectative, you know, I was not waiting for something and I was not dreaming of just one goal. And it was uh, for a lot of decisions in my life, it really helped me. Mm -hmm. So you actually started off wanting to become a gymnast and when you were 11 you were sent to the Paris Opera Ballet for a year's training and um, that's when you discovered that actually it was ballet that really excited you. Yes, I had a, a year um, when I was doing gymnastic and dance, you know, I was uh, living the, the life of the little rat, we call that in Paris Opera, the little uh, uh, pupils of dance. And at the same time I was doing gymnastic. But at the end of that year, uh, there was a show and the directress uh, of the school, um, Claude Bessy, asked me if I wanted to, to be part of it. She saw that, you know, uh, an, I had a, a friend with me and she was not really gifted in dance, but she thought that I could maybe do the, the show. And I said, yes, why not? Because up to now it was not really fun. So let's try the, the show. And the rehearsal, the, the costume, the makeup. And finally, you know, when you're on stage and the curtain going up, the performance, the moment and the reaction of the audience, that was it. That was it. So then you joined the um, Paris um, uh, Ballet and um, when the legendary dancer Rudolf Nureyev became director of that, he plucked you at the age of 19 from the ranks of the, uh, of the ballet dancers. What do you think he saw in you? Well, I mean, I was... Uh, 19, I was really uh, motivated and I had some quality. I think he saw maybe this, um, this passion I had on stage and the fact that I, I was always considering the moment on stage something special and it was a different way of uh, being, being on stage, you know. And uh, we were lucky. We were really lucky. We were a bunch of young people, very angry, very motivated. And you were and dancing you with this great name. But I have to say, Sylvie, because you fought with um, Rudolf Nureyev, or rather you disagreed yeah, with him about matter. some of the choices he made for you. It's not that. It, it didn't matter, you know. It's, uh, he was someone really intelligent with a vision, and he gave us the opportunity right away. And then the fact that we were a little bit similar, you know. He didn't know how to communicate. I didn't know how to communicate. He was shy. I was shy. So so automatically. Were you really shy though because you must have been very confident at such a young age to take on as it were one of the greatest dancers of all time, Nureyev, so much older than you and so on? No, it was a question of being just and fair and sometimes I thought that even if he was Rudolf Nureyev he was not fair. So, but he knew that. He knew Give that. me an example of how you thought he was unfair. Well, I mean, he was screaming very fast and he wanted, he didn't want to discuss, you know, and uh, it Just was... Just do this, do that. Yeah, it was his decision first and uh, so, and sometimes I thought it was unfair, you know, he was taking a lot of time for a rehearsal and I had something else to do after. I could see my timing passing and I could not rehearse, you know, so we had a fight there, you know, it's like enough of your ballet, please give me the opportunity okay, to do it. It's interesting because the American director, William Forsyth, says of you, she was the first ballerina to take her career into her own hands and that subsequently led to that very famous nickname which I don't know how you <laughs> feel about it as Mademoiselle non. non for being too assertive and that was the nickname that was given to you by Anthony Dowell then director of the Royal Ballet yeah. here in London. Well I'm proud of it in a way 
You know, it was funny at the beginning, and it was, uh, but uh, it's, it was important for me. I left Paris Opera because I was not happy there, and they wanted me to do things I didn't want to do. You left I in 1989. In 19, yes, in 19, to go to Paris, to uh, Royal Ballet, and I didn't want to start again the same thing, you know. So when I was offering, uh, offered things I didn't want to do, I mean, I said no, but it was coming from a, a woman and from a dancer. And we are used to say yes and do what we are told. Because you had very, very um, well-reported disagreements with the choreographer, Sir Kenneth, the late choreographer, Sir Kenneth Macmillan. And on one occasion, apparently, a full-scale row went out on the tannoy system and people in the company could hear. Um, you know everything. What you were fighting. <laughs> oh, I, I looked at this. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, and, but why do you think that you fought with him so much? Because what Anthony and Dow said of you is, although he's a big admirer of yours, obviously, he says Sylvie didn't understand that choreographers were gods and ruled the roost. Ego problem. It, would, it was only yours or ego his? problem. You yours know, or, or Sir Kenneth Macmillan's? Well, I think, we, you know what, with all those years and all the people I met around, I realized that my ego was very, very small compared to a lot of other people. And I think in that one, it was his ego, you know, because he approached me as being a French boring star. I'm French, yes, star, I'm not the one deciding. Boring, I don't think so, but it was not anything artistic, you know, it was more personal. Hmm. Because, I mean, you talk about your, um, he saw you as a French, star because William Tuckett um, from the Royal Corps de Ballet dancer and choreographer said stardom is somehow frightfully un-British. Do you think there was a bit of a culture clash there you were this Parisian moving to London Royal Ballet? Yeah it might have been a, a bit of that but I think he was uh, he had been a little bit um, upset because I said no of, to one of his ballets. That was basically only that, you know. Mm. They offered me one of his ballets he was really, um, you know, proud of, I guess, and he wanted me to do it. But I didn't want to do it for many reasons, and I said mm -hmm. no. That was the problem, I Is think. that the problem only? Because, I mean, there have been some, uh, you know, been some debate about your personality. For instance, one uh, ballerina at the Royal Ballet writes about how thrilled she was when you joined the Royal Ballet, but she said of you, Sylvie just wouldn't have anything to do with us. She wouldn't talk, share dressing rooms, wouldn't eat in the canteen. And you issued a communique from your dressing room saying, if I want to know what the weather's like, I can look out of the window. I don't need to go down to the canteen and talk about it. That does sound yeah. a bit aloof. No, I mean, you have to uh, understand that I arrived, I was 24, I left Paris Opera, I was very shy, my English was very bad, and, and then no one in, at the Royal Ballet helped me with the English, you know. And I discovered after a lot of people were speaking French, but no one helped me. So automatically, and also I lived through a, different, um, a difficult time in Paris Opera, so it's not easy to make friends right away and then be disappointed. So I think that at the time I, I prefer not to make friends uh, in order not to be disappointed. <laughs> mm -hmm. But you also, in your dancing, um, push the boundaries and, and you are famously known for your ability to stretch one leg up to your ear. Um, do you break the rules of that rule of classical ballet almost in a way consciously? Do you want to innovate or is it just that you want to show people that you could do this? It was my way of doing it. And that's where it was important for me to uh, not to have a dream, not to dream of being a ballerina. It's what I, I feel I could do on stage, the way I wanted to do, and that was my way of expressing. It was not showing off, it was not like uh, proving anything else, mm. it was not against any uh, tradition or, no. It was my way, my vision of it. Mm. It didn't appeal to everybody. I mean, many years ago, 14 years ago, the. Uh, Clement Crisp, uh, the, the Financial Times um, ballet critic, uh, just really didn't like it at all and described it as your dancing in general as vulgar, is what he said. Yeah, well, he said that, but at the same time, when they asked Margot Fontaine, you know, if uh, what she thought about lifting the leg like this, she said, well, if I could have done it, I would have done it. Mm -hmm. So, yes, it's because people are used to something and they don't want to lose it. It's, uh, it's kind of a nostalgia mm. uh, way of uh, behaving, you see. The late Italian ballet critic, critic Victoria Ottolenghi um, said uh, your performances could be detached. She says, for instance, you dance the black swan perfectly lovely to look at, but perfect and cold. And, and that observation has been made about your dancing. Um, one male royal ballet principal says that uh, while you're aware of Sylvie's acting while she's 
on the stage, when you're on stage with her, it just doesn't cross the lights. Do you feel you need well, to put more passion, I, more acting into your No, I don't agree at all. I don't agree at all. Again, people are used to have like people, you know, expressing things like, you know, in the past. So they don't recognize the code. They don't recognize the way you do it. But I can tell you a lot of people after said, you know, that they lived through the story with me and they understood the story and, and that's it. It's just a, a way of habit. And when you break the habit of the people, they are lost and they, they prefer to say that you are wrong than maybe they can see differently. Do you think that um, we all see the world of ballet as this obviously beautiful uh, world and you know beautiful dancers and wonderful sets and so on, but you've also spoken in the past about how through your work you've learnt about people and betrayal and stupidity. You've said. Do you remember saying that? And what yes, did you mean yes, by that? Yes, because I mean, a company, a dance company, is like a representation of society. It's a small society there, so you have all kind of person. And and it's true that uh, I was very naive. You know, I thought that uh, maybe with my upbringing, and uh, I was uh, convinced that uh, being as a group, you could you know help each other and things like this. But uh, I realized then I was never part of a group. People, even if I wanted to be, people never saw me as part of the group. Why? Because already when I was a young gymnast, I was uh, the youngest of the team. I, I could do things, you know, I, I could do things very nicely. And then I was on the top of that, the daughter of the teacher. So I had to play, you know, one step under to, to be accepted. Then when I arrived at Paris Opera School, it was the same thing. The director saw me and asked me to be part of it. She saw that I had quality and she gave me some, you know, things to do before the others. So all of that, you, to be accepted with the group, you need to, to play really under. Mm. I mean, we hear about rivalries going on in the world of ballet and of course the most extreme example in recent times was a couple of years ago when the Bolshoi um, so ballet soloist Pavel Dmitrichenko um, was jailed along with somebody else for throwing acid into the face of the artistic director of the Bolshoi ballet, um, Sergei Filin, and we heard about all the intrigue that was going on behind the scenes, the allegations of favouritism, bribery even. Does that resonate with you in any way? Did you experience, perhaps not to that degree obviously, no, no, not at any all. of that kind of poisonous rivalry? No, not at all. No, no. It was uh, it was through the work in, in in Paris Opera and at the Royal Ballet. It was through the work we were competing in a way, you know. But, uh, but no, no, that didn't, didn't bring about any kind of jealousy that you felt aware of. Because I mean, it's not just at the Bolshoi. I have to say to you, Victor Hochhauser, who promotes the Bolshoi, told the BBC this year, jealousies are not unknown to me in dealing with other companies too. Though of course he says what happened at the Bolshoi was outside the usual norm. But you must have seen things. No, in your as I time. said, it's uh, the same than in a bigger society, you know. So you have the same kind of uh, admiration, hatred, jealousy. You have that, you know. A human being is there also as a dancer. Everything that is good about it and everything that is bad. But it never went to an extent of being threatened or something like this, never. You left the Royal Ballet for good in 2007. You joined Sadler as well. And then you began also to work in contemporary dance and so on. Did you see that as a kind of new beginning in your life? Not at all. Uh, I always said that uh, I was lucky as a young dancer to have Rudolf Nureyev as a director in Paris Opera. He brought the light into Paris Opera and also he opened the door to any kind of style, choreographers from everywhere in the world and contemporary work at the same time as classical. And for us, it was fantastic. The same day we were doing a, a classical ballet, really classical, and at the same time we were doing Bob Wilson, theater only. And, and I said, okay, that's, that's what I want to do. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to experience everything I can on that stage, whether it's classical or contemporary. And that's what you're doing now in your farewell tour because you turned 50 this year and um, you, you've got your worldwide tour where you're performing in lots of venues and across different continents and it's called Life in Progress and that's interesting because that's quite a contradictory title to have for somebody's farewell tour, Life in Progress. Well, I had to choose a program for this uh, big decision I took, you know, and uh, it was or going back and having a little bit of nostalgia into the program or doing a best of, and I didn't want to do that. And I said, well, the best way to, to end, you know, it's to go on the way I did up to now. And so you're working with um, famous choreographers like 
Akram Khan, Matt Sek, William Forsyth and so on. But you've asked, you've got a new duet that's been created for you with the Italian dancer Emanuela Montanari. And that's quite unusual, isn't it, for one ballerina to perform a duet with another ballerina? Well, maybe it is, yes, but it's uh, something I, I had never experienced. So, and uh, I thought it was a, a good uh, choice also for the, the type of uh, choreography of Russell Maliphant. And also I tried to choose someone that really wanted to do something, you know, and Emanuela Montanari is, uh, is a dancer that is really happy to be there and wants to know and wants to work. So it's a nice experience. Are you making us kind of stand there for? Ballerinas, you said earlier on that you know people saw you as being too assertive because they were used to ballerinas being doing what they were told. I mean, do you almost see yourself as do you see yourself as a feminist, for instance? Well, of course, yeah. It's a lot of things to be done for women. You know, we think that we we made a lot of progress, but yes, yes, I am. A, but not in the wrong way, you know, mm -hmm. not in the silly little things. Uh, I think that it's true that women doesn't have the her place in the world and I think it doesn't make the the, the world is unbalanced mm. because of that still and especially for women in ballet we hear a great deal I mean obviously uh, everybody in ballet be they male or female suffer a lot for their art because of the you know punishing exercise schedules and so on but there's a lot of emphasis put on the size of ballerinas and you know the fact that we know that there are eating disorders which affect ballerinas disproportionately to other women and so on. I mean, you've seen those pressures, presumably. Well, I've seen it, but again, you know, uh, it's really in the mind of the people that what we do, it's a sacrifice. I mean, we are lucky to do that. We are lucky that finally we do something that we like. Ask around how many people in, in the world do things that they like, that they choose. So that's what I'm doing. And most of the people who go on stage, it should be th that way. So one day someone asked me, was it a sacrifice? Not at all. It's a lot of work, yes. It's a lot of time, a lot of effort, but it's great. And I chose it. So, yeah, and sometimes you have people who are doing it because the parents are pushing them and then they start to have psychological problems, then they start, you know, eating mm. disorder and all of that. But in overall, it should be a, a, something of passion. Really, because I mean, the, the Cuban dancer, Carlos Acosta has said, dancing is not an easy life. We work extremely hard and we pay a price. People often don't see that side of it. So it's a pay, it's a price to pay, but I prefer to have, you know, a bit of difficulty to walk in the morning <laughs> than to have to wake up every day and go to a, an office or to do a job that I don't want to do, which is really, a, you know, it's only one life. This one is a place where it's extraordinary moment that you are living. So yes, you have a, a, a price to pay. Yes, it's difficult, but it doesn't matter. It's not made for the people to know that, mm. you know, and also people come here to dream. You're not going to show that it's difficult to do it. So when you get out of bed in the morning, sometimes you feel stiff and you I don't... mean, since I am 20, you know, it's, it's just part of it. Part it's part of, being of it. A ballet yes, dancer. it's part Even of it. Even if you have problems with joints and so on and hips or whatever in the many years to come. I would not feel... change. I would not change my, uh, my job. I, I mean, I'm doing that for 39 years now. Mm. You know, I would not change anything. Mm. You, you are, um, you've talked about how when you do retire at the end of this year that you want to engage more with some of the causes that you are attached to, in particular Sea Shepherd, the conservation society, and you're wearing their t-shirt there. Yes, it's am, a society yeah. that protects <laughs> ocean wildlife and you were on the Faroe Islands last year along with other celebrities, Charlie Sheen, Pamela Anderson, you're a vegan, um, but do you, what do you say to critics who might say, look, oh, you're another celebrity lending your name to another cause? Is that how you see it or do you see it as... Uh, uh, you know, again, those things. Uh, I realized that since I'm doing that, uh, I changed my life five years ago and I decided that yeah, something triggers something in me, you know. And uh, I want the people to have this kind of trigger also to open their eyes and maybe do their part. So I can do it because I go in the theater and I touch, you know, more people than when I go to the restaurant and you have a table of four people. And if among those people, some people can open their eyes and change their life and do something, that's great. When you left the Faroe Islands uh, last year, 14 activists were arrested uh, after you had gone. Does that concern you at all that sometimes activism might border on the 
side of illegal activities or possibly legal activities? No, what bothers me is that you put in prison those people who try basically to, to save uh, the life, uh, um, that f they are fighting for the respect of life and for a future. They go to jail, but the people who are destroying... You like know, illegal the, whaling, for the, instance. The planet. Yeah. yeah, well, I'm big business businesses, you know, multinational. They are, you know, it's legal for them to destroy the world, whether it's with pesticide, whether it's, you know, by uh, fishing, overfishing. All of that is legal. It's destroying or cutting the forest. You know, it's all of that is oxygen. All of that is the future. They are not. It's not a problem. But the the people who want to say, okay, listen, this is not right. This is not right. They go to jail do because think, they I are mean, disturbing. But do you say you that because I mean, you're a vegan. You say you don't believe in a single animal dying for you. Um, and when you look at the fuss that has been created by the shooting dead of uh, the, the wonderful lion in Zimbabwe and the the dentist from America who did it, he says, inadvertently and so on. I mean, there's been a lot of fuss, backlash against that kind of thing. People aren't complacent, are they? I think if it can open the, the eyes of other of people about, you know, the, the killing, you know, I mean, just to kill for a sport, for me, it's, I can't really understand. I, I don't understand that it exists still. So, I mean, he killed the wrong, you know, one more animal too, too many and people, started to be aware of that but uh, it's a lot of things that are not ethical as a human being and this is part of it you can't be just doing a sport and kill animal you can't have the family you know going to a safari and kill a giraffe and have their picture in the newspaper just because you know it's what what is on their mind you know we we are part of an equilibrium animal nature and human being one with the, without the others we don't survive so why, as a human being, we have the arrogance to think, to think that we have the right of life and death on nature or animal? Mm. You told the BBC a couple of years ago that uh, you don't have children, you have two dogs instead. And you said actually... And a cat. In a way, and a cat. <laughs> mustn't forget the cat. You said, in a way, why should I bring children? Why should I have brought children into a world like this? And you've talked about how by 2050 you believe that a billion people will be without water and that people will be killing one another for yeah, water. So you don't want to have children. You paint this apocalyptic scenario. Are you not being too cynical, too much of a pessimist, and underestimating human beings' capacity to adapt? to difficult circumstances? Oh, uh, if, you, if you call it to adapt, to kill each other, to have a little drop of water or to have some food. No, uh, I mean, uh, that uh, scenario may not actually happen. You're being well, I, very I'm not pessimistic. The one, I didn't invent it. You know, it's a lot of uh, scientists and for many years who, who proved it that it's going to happen. And uh, so I'm just looking at what is happening. You know, it's, uh, we are um, spoiling, I don't know if it's the right word, the, the earth, thinking that it's, for, uh, it's never ending, the resources, and it is ending. We are seven and a half billion uh, people here, and in a few years' time, we'll be 10 billion. Already with the number we are, we can't feed everybody. And we are just going on the head against the wall, just not wanting to see what's going to happen. Finally, you've made it clear that activism is something you're going to be doing more of when you stop dancing. But you know, Margot Fontaine retired at 60. You're only 50. Could it be possible for your legions of fans out there that you could make a comeback? No, 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 I don't think so. No, no, I decided that the decision was hard enough to take, you know, and uh, so uh, I decided that the, the, the career as a dancer, the way I'm doing it with the energy and the motivation I have, that's going to be it this time. Sylvie Guillem, thank you very much indeed for coming on Thanks Hard Talk. Thanks to you. Thank you.